My name is Rowan Gray and I'm one of the uh, organisers of this series, um, the School Events Chair for the Columbia Law School Workers' Rights Student Coalition. I'd like to thank you all for making it out tonight. Uh, we obviously put this series on because we think this is a pretty important issue right now and we think that uh, both for law students and the broader community in Columbia and New York City this is an important uh, topic to be coming to terms with as we go into the election season and as we look at the next sort of stage in America's economic development and indeed the world itself. So yeah, I'm going to be very short. I just want to give you a few details about this event as well as the series structure and then I'll just pass it off to our moderator today, William Harris. Uh, first of all, this is designed to be a learning experience. We're not trying to sort of have people speak at you and then leave feeling uncomfortable. So if there are any questions at all, please keep them in your head and please make sure you ask them. We've devoted half of the entire time of this series for questions in the audience and we'll be taking questions after the presentations are done and trying to get through as many of them as we can. So please make sure that if there's anything you feel curious about or that it doesn't gel with your understanding or anything like that, please don't feel uh, sort of worried about it being uh, not the right type of question. There is no wrong question in this context. We're trying to set up a dialogue going forward. Second thing I'd like to say is thank you for everybody who registered online. It gives us some idea of the interest in this series. And please make sure that you check out all of the re reading that's associated with these events, as well as the blog posts. And if you feel like contributing on the forum after this, if there are any ideas here that you felt were interesting, please make sure you do that there as well. Uh, if I may introduce the people here today, first of all, we have the moderator from Columbia University's History Department, Professor William Harris. He is the William R. Shepard Professor of History and the Director of the Centre for the Ancient Mediterranean. Professor Harris has written a number of books uh, related to the history of money, uh, including Rome's Imperial Economy, War and Imperialism in Republic and Rome, and has edited a number of books including the monetary systems of the Greeks and Romans, and written a number of articles related to money. Uh, professor Randall Ray, who will be speaking first, is a professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and the research director at the Center for Full Employment and Price Stability at that university. He's also a senior scholar at the Levi Economics Institute and was a student of Hyman Minsky, who some people may know has recently uh, garnered some attention in light of the recent financial crisis. Professor Michael Hudson is a former Wall Street analyst and a distinguished research professor of History at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He is also the president of the Institute of Long-Term Economic Trends and has authored over 10 books on finance, economics, and the history of economic thought. Uh, his most recent book is available here for purchase. Sorry, can you just tell me the name of it? Uh, it's the Bubble and Beyond. The Bubble and Beyond, that's right. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I had it And will be available here if you, anyone would be interested in looking at it later. Uh, I'll, without further ado, I'll hand it over so we can get started. Uh, thank you, Rowan, for organizing this and helping to organize this. I, I think this is a splendid occasion and I applaud this initiative very much. I'm a professor of history. I'm a, I teach about the history of the Greeks and Romans. I revel in my irrelevance, in a sense. But, wait a minute, not irrelevant. Uh, and uh, in particular, as far as Roman history is concerned, uh, we might think of that economy as being uh, uh, the first complex economy that we know a great deal about, uh, and we know a great deal about the monetary systems of, of antiquity. Our focus, obviously, today um, is on uh, the here and now, uh, and uh, what I may have to say about this, which will be probably be criticisms of our distinguished speakers, uh, will be fairly limited. My job is to be a moderator, uh, that is to say to prevent the speeches going on for more than an hour and a half each, uh, and to make sure that everybody out there, I want to emphasize something that Ron was just saying, to make sure that anybody out there who wants to make a point, ask a question, uh, uh, can do so. Uh, so I will be alert to uh, hands waving and listen. So uh, we're going to start with uh, Randall Ray, I think. Is that right? Uh, and uh, so here's the mic, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Coming series, there will be quite a number of people who will be 
carrying on with this particular view of money, which is an alternative to what is normally taught in economics courses. I think it is closer to what is taught outside of economics, including in history. Let's start with a quiz. Um, what I'm, I'm going to ask you questions that actually have a correct answer. Okay? These are not matters of theory, ideology, theology, and they are not policy proposals. They are just questions about the way that a sovereign currency works. And by sovereign currency, I mean a currency in which the national government issues its own currency, okay? Such as the United States, Japan, Turkey. This would not include countries that adopt foreign currencies and also would not include European nations that adopted the euro. I'll save just one slide on the euro, but you're going to have in the future, a whole session devoted to the euro, okay? So here we go. Just like a household, the government has to finance its spending out of its income or through borrowing. Is that true or false? False. You can write down your answer. Question two. The role of taxes is to provide finance for government spending. True or false? The national government borrows money from the private sector to finance the budget deficit. True or false? Thanks, you. You're going to get a lot of these wrong. <laughs> By running budget surpluses, the government takes pressure off interest rates because more funds are then available for private sector investment projects. True or false? Persistent budget deficits will burden future generations with inflation and higher taxes. Running budget surpluses now will help build up the funds necessary to cope with the aging population in the future. True or false? Okay, you can tally your results. They're all false. Every one of those is false. Recently, there's a paper at St. Louis Fed. Let me read this and then translate it. St. Louis Fed, if you don't know, is a bastion of monetarism. This is Milton Friedman uh, type economics. So what I'm telling you it is accepted from right to left, okay? As the sole manufacturer of dollars whose debt is denominated in dollars, the U.S. government can never become insolvent, i.e. unable to pay its bills. In this sense, the government is not dependent on credit markets to remain <coughs> operational. Moreover, there will always be a market for U.S. government debt at home because the U.S. government has the only means of creating risk-free dollar-denominated assets. Let me translate. Government can never run out of dollars. It can never be forced to default. It can never be forced to miss a payment. It is never subject to the whims of bond vigilantes. Okay? That's what the St. Louis Fed tells us. And you can find virtually identical quotes from Bernanke, from Greenspan. Okay? And really from almost all economists. When President Obama tells you we're running out of money, that the piggy bank is empty, that is just not true. And all economists know that it's not true. Okay, so the question is, why do they lie to you? There's a, a nice little video uh, by uh, Blaug in which he interviews Paul Samuelson. I won't read this long thing. You can see the PowerPoint uh, later. He says, there's an element of truth in the superstition that the budget must be balanced. He says at all times, but then later on, he um, talks about uh, over uh, long period, longer periods of time. It's a, he likens it to an old-fashioned religion used to scare people, okay, uh, so that they will behave in a particular way. He says we've taken a, we have taken away a belief in the intrinsic necessity of balancing the budget, if not every year, then over a short period of time. If Prime Minister Gladstone came back to life, he would say. Uh-oh, what have you done? And James Buchanan argues in those terms. I have to say, I see merit in that view. So he likens it to a superstition, an old-time religion. Okay, we have to do this because we have a fear that our elected representatives will spend without limit. And so we make up this lie that the federal government is like a U.S. household. You hear this all the time in the debates about the budget. 
the U.S. government is like a house. That is not true. Unless you have a printing press in your basement and you're printing up dollars, you are nothing like the federal government. The federal government creates money as it spends. So the framework that I'm working from, called Modern Money, um, will use modern money to answer these sorts of questions. What is money? Why is it accepted? What's the relation of the government to its money? What is fiscal policy and what is monetary policy? Almost all the conventional wisdoms that provide answers to these have got it wrong. Okay? Are these things money? The top one is a rock that 500,000 years ago um, some humans made scratches in to record something. We don't know what they were recording. Below that, these are um, bones that are 50,000 years old that humans carved more complicated marks in these to record something. We don't know what they are. Here uh, is some more evidence of things on which humans carved notches or cuneiform. What are these? We know what these are because we can read them. Okay. Does anyone know what the things on the left are? Tally sticks. Okay. Stock and stub. And we, we all have heard the term. Raise a tally. So the crown, when he wanted to buy sheep from you, would issue a tally stick to you. Okay. You would accept this in payment for the sheep you sold to the king. Okay? And there would be the stick is split into stock and stub to keep a record. Okay? And uh, the clay shibati tablets Michael might be talking about. How about these? Okay, finally you see something, you, ah, there's money. Okay, what are these? These are records, just like the tally sticks. They're records of credits and debits. And of course today, the currency is fairly insignificant. Most of these records are kept electronically on balance sheets. Okay, so what is money? It's a social unit of account. And in fact, it is almost always a state money of account. In the United States, it's the dollar. Okay? Speak up, really? I sounded loud to myself. <laughs> um, it's a record of a debit or credit. The dollar, our money unit, is like an inch, or a foot, or a pound, okay, or a liter. It's a measuring unit. We then have money things that are denominated in our money unit. It's a little bit confusing in the United States because we use the word dollar to indicate both the measuring unit and the thing that's being measured, a little piece of paper that's green. Okay? That has not always been the case in uh, monetary history, but in the United States it is true. We then have a hierarchy of these money things. My professor, Hyman Minsky, used to always say, you know, anybody can create money, and he meant money things. Then he would add, the problem lies in getting it accepted. The government's money things are widely accepted. My money things are much less widely accepted. There is a hierarchy of these money things. The important thing is almost always the money things are denominated in the state's money of account, dollars. I could issue money things denominated in rays, okay? But it's much more common to denominate them in the state's money of account. What backs up our money? When I started teaching in the early 80s, I would ask my students, and probably three-quarters of economic students said gold. Well, it wasn't true even then, okay? And today, almost nobody is confused about this because we have Ron Paul running around saying, we need to back our money with gold, right? So now they know that it's not. I like to, to read what it says on the paper currencies. U.S. dollar, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. So more sophisticated students would say, ah, it's legal tender. And it's true, many currencies, have a statement like that. Canadian dollar, Australian dollar, UK pound. Get out the pound and look at it. It says, picture of the queen. I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of five pounds on a five pound note. 
So in other words, if you take that five pound note to the queen, she promises to pay you another five pound note. That's all she promises. No gold, no legal tender. She promises to give you another one in exchange. Okay, so, and in Europe, no legal tender laws. So what backs these things up? So some even more sophisticated students say fiat. The government just says it's worth it all. That gets a little bit closer to the truth, but it sounds like there's nothing that backs up the currency. You don't want to look behind the dollar bill. There's nothing there, right? Okay, the alternative view, modern money view. Use of the currency and value of money are based on the power of the issuing authority, not on intrinsic value. That should be fairly obvious now, okay? Where most of our money things are just electronic entries on balance sheets. Even in the case of the government. That's the way that it mostly spends, not by issuing green paper money, but through an electronic entry. The state played the central role in the evolution of money. I think that Michael will talk about this. And from the beginning, used and in fact purposely created the monetary system to move resources to the public sector. That was the purpose of creating a monetary system. We find, as uh, Charles Gerdhardt says, that in almost every case we have a one nation, one currency. Euroland is the first major experiment in breaking this link between nations and their currencies. It's not going so well for them if you're paying attention to what's going on in Euroland. So separate currencies is not a coincidence. It's tied up with sovereign power, political independence, and fiscal authority. As a shorthand, what we say is taxes drive money. Taxes are denominated in the state's unit of account. The state spends its currency into existence. When you got that tally stick from the crown, why on earth would you sell your sheep to the crown for a stick? Because you could use your half of the stick to pay your taxes. Now, taxes are just one example of an obligation that the authority can put on you. In the old days, fees and fines were much more important than taxes. But today, it's mostly taxes that drive money. But any form of an obligation that you owe the authorities will work to drive a currency. <clears throat> How does a government, a modern government actually spend? Through keystrokes. Okay? When the government wants to buy something or make a transfer payment, social security payment, it credits a bank's reserves and the bank credits your demand deposit. All electronically, that's the way modern states spend. So they are spending their own money unit into existence. Taxes just reverse that. The government debits your bank's reserves and the bank debits your account. So it's credits and debits. Okay? And banks are sort of like our scorekeepers. They keep track of these credits and debits for us. When the government credits more accounts than it debits, we call that deficit spending. That's what deficit spending is. The government has created more money than it has debited in tax payments. So the government net credits bank reserves, and the bank net credits the account of the recipient. Okay, why does the government sell bonds? The government can buy anything it wants by crediting bank accounts. Why does it sell bonds? It doesn't need its own money from the population. It creates its own money every time it spends. It never needs to borrow. In fact, if you look at the balance sheets, there is no way that the currency issuer can borrow its own currency. That makes no sense at all. And in fact, it could not be done. So they don't borrow their own currency. Deficit spending leads to net credits to banking system reserves. This will normally lead to excess reserves. If we're running a $1 trillion budget deficit, by identity, we're creating a $1 trillion of bank reserves. In normal times, banks don't want to hold excess reserves, so they offer them in the overnight market called the Fed Funds Market in the United States. That drives the overnight interest rate down, okay? Potentially to zero. And so what the Fed does is it sells bonds to drain excess reserves. 
So bond sales are actually part of monetary policy, and it really doesn't matter whether it's the Fed that sells them or the Treasury that sells them. The purpose of selling bonds is to drain excess reserves from the banking system so that the central bank can hit its overnight interest rate target. Otherwise, the interest rate would be driven to zero. Okay, we're in unusual times right now where the Fed wants the interest rate to be about zero. So it can leave excess reserves in the banking system, but this is not normal. Um, so really, bond sales have nothing to do with borrowing. They're not part of the fiscal operations of the state. They're part of the monetary policy operations to hit the interest rate target. And uh, just in parentheses, a budget surplus is the opposite. You're always draining the reserves out of the system. You've got to put them back in. You do that through open market purchases. Central bank policy. There, we've had a long history of debate about what the central bank uh, should do. Should it have a money target? Should it have an inflation target? Should it have interest rate targets? Okay, there, economists have finally reached a consensus. Okay, one that we discovered a long time ago, which is that central banks always operate with an overnight interest rate target. No matter what they tell you, that's what they're actually doing. An overnight interest rate target. And that means that they have to accommodate exactly the demand for reserves or they'll miss their target. And that is why they use the bond sales or bond purchases in order to make sure banks have the right amount of uh, currency reserves. What this means is that the interest rate is set by the central bank and they hit their interest rate target through the open market operations. Okay? Now, they set it anywhere they want. If we want zero interest rates, we can have zero interest rates. It doesn't matter whether the budget deficit is a trillion dollars or we have a budget surplus. We can hit our interest rate target. This is not true for a country that is not sovereign in the, the currency sense that I'm using that term. So, for example, Greece cannot set its interest rate. Okay, it is subject to the bond vigilantes. The United States is not, and neither is Japan. And note, Japan has budget deficits even bigger than ours, and they've been doing it for more than 20 years and has zero interest rates all along, because they want them to be zero. So far, everything I've told you is a description of reality. There's no policy recommendation, there's no theory involved in this. I didn't say anything about what the government ought to do, I'm describing what the government actually does. Okay, we can move on to policy that could follow from this. And here I'll um, rely on Abba Lerner, uh, what he called the principles of functional finance. Here we're talking about should, not what the government actually um, does. The government should spend more if there's unemployment. If you have unemployment, it means government spending is too low. You need to spend more. If the unemployment rate is 8%, forget the budget deficit, it's not important. We cannot go insolvent, we can never miss a payment. We have to solve the unemployment problem, okay? So government should spend more. Government can also reduce taxes. It's usually less effective, but that's also a policy option. The government should supply more money, what he meant was bank reserves, if interest rates are too high, okay? Of course, that's not a problem right now. We're supplying plenty of reserves, and the banks have plenty of excess. And he uh, insisted that the budgetary outcome and the government debt outcome should never be a primary consideration. What matters is unemployment, inflation, and where the interest rates are relative to where you want them to be. Now, governments are not financially constrained, but they do impose, self-impose constraints on themselves. Okay? These may be a good idea, they may be a bad idea, the point is they are self-imposed. We have a variety of self-imposed constraints. We have a budgeting process. That is a self-imposed constraint. And it's probably a good idea to have a budgeting process, okay? We have debt limits in the United States, we're kind of unusual. We say, we tell the federal government, go ahead and spend this amount per year, but oh, but if you get up to the debt limit, you can't spend. This is probably not a very good self-imposed constraint, but we imposed it on ourselves. We can remove it any time we want, and normally we remove it every time we reach it. Okay? This next time around, maybe we won't, okay? but it's self-imposed. Markets don't impose it. Okay? It doesn't come from any law of nature. We imposed it. And we also have operational constraints, and so people will say, well, hold on, what you told us before isn't quite right. 
because the Treasury has to write checks on its account at the central bank, the Fed. Okay, this is true. The Treasury has to have money in its account at the central bank. But we found ways to make sure it always has the money in its account, because otherwise it would be bouncing checks to Social Security recipients, for example. So we never have the Treasury running out of money in its account. And I can talk about that if you want. And when Stephanie Kelton comes, she's the best on this topic. We also have the central bank is prohibited from buying treasury debt new issues. So the central bank can't buy bonds directly from the treasury because that would allow the treasury to very easily always have money in its account. Okay, But again, we get around this very easily. The treasury just sells them to banks and then the, the uh, treasury's account at private banks is moved to the Fed. Okay, And then the Fed buys the bonds from the banks. So they get around it easily, but the point is it's self-imposed. They use special depositories and special uh, tax and loan accounts. Summary. Am I doing all right? Okay. Uh, deficit spending creates private financial wealth, net credits. Note that central banking operations do not. We've got, we've got uh, the Fed doing its best, I suppose, to stimulate the economy. But the problem is, it can't provide any net credits. It can buy assets from you, but it can't spend money into existence. It has to lend money into existence, or substitute assets you've already got for a credit at the Fed. This doesn't stimulate much. This is why quantitative easing hasn't done anything, and it won't. All it can do is drive interest rates to zero, that's it. The Treasury spends money into existence. It's much more effective. It doesn't matter whether bonds have to be sold first, which is one of the self-imposed constraints, so long as the central bank accommodates reserve demand, uh, there uh, is no limit on the treasury due to this self-imposed constraint. It doesn't matter whether the central bank is prohibited from buying new issues, it goes round about that um, through the banks, and it doesn't matter whether treasury must have money in its account at the central bank to spend. Uh, the central bank and banks cooperate to make sure it always has the money in its account. Euro, one slide. This is an example of a non-sovereign currency from the point of view of the individual member states. They gave up their own sovereign currencies, the lira, when they joined the union. They adopted what is essentially a foreign currency for each one of these states. They became very much like USA states. And this is what we argued from before the time that uh, the EMU began. We said they're going to be subject to the market in the same way that Mississippi is subject to the market. The only surprise is that markets ignored that fact for as long as that they, they did. They are constrained in their spending uh, by tax revenue, bond sales, and ultimately by the willingness of the ECB to lend to them and to buy government debt. And we're finding that the ECB is very gradually and begrudgingly doing this. Okay, But there's a great uncertainty over how far this will go, and that's why Euroland is in such a mess. The problem is, Although the ECB has been behaving in a way similar to what the Fed is doing, they have nothing like Washington, Uncle Sam, to provide spending euros into existence. So the ECB can lend them, but they have no equivalent to Washington to spend them into existence to solve their problem. Conclusions. Currency issuing government spends by crediting bank accounts, taxes by debiting those. It can always afford to spend more. There still are issues such as inflation, exchange rate effects, and interest rate effects. Okay? But there is no affordability problem. When the president tells you he's run out of money, that is just not true. Sovereign currency gives more policy space. There's no default risk. The government can control its interest rates, and it can use policy to achieve full employment. Now, I need to be careful because people hear things I didn't say. So let me go through a few things I did not say. I did say sovereign government faces no financial constraints. It cannot become insolvent in its own non-convertible. That just means we don't promise to exchange it for gold or for foreign currencies at a fixed exchange rate. But it can only buy what is for sale. It can't buy things that aren't for sale for its own currency. For the United States, this is not a problem. Everything for sale in the United States is for sale in dollars. But that's not always true. 
even in some countries that have sovereign currencies, there are things not for sale in their own sovereign currency. So that can be a problem. I did not say the government ought to buy everything for sale. Okay. The size of the government is a political decision with economic effects. Is our government too big? That's a political question. Okay. Could we afford a bigger government? Of course we could. Should we have a bigger government? Political question. Okay. With economic effects. I did not say that deficits cannot be inflationary. If government spending is too high, you can get inflation. Okay. Um, I did not say that deficits can't affect exchange rates. If our government spent more, ran us up to full employment, it's possible the dollar could devalue. I'll tell you the empirical evidence for that is extremely poor. There is no direct link between the size of government spending and the size of budget deficits and the value of a currency. Okay. Uh, Alan Greenspan said, we have no economic model that is able to explain exchange rate movements. Okay. And the reason is because speculation plays such a big role. And finally, I, um, uh, if a sovereign government lets its currency float, that gives it more policy space. I won't go through that now, but people who studied economics know what I mean. Um, and floating means a currency can go up and down. So yes, it's possible that fiscal policy and monetary policy that are adopted to achieve full employment, for example, could have impacts on the exchange rate. Thanks. You can uh, read more at um, the blogs or at the, the Levy Institute or email me. And I hope that this will be up online. Thanks. Thanks very much. Nice provocative talk. Uh, I think the best way to go will be to see what immediate reactions there are. And we shouldn't let that go on for too long because we want to give our second speaker a chance. But let's see whether there's anyone who would like to uh, raise objections, uh, assassinate the speaker, or anything like that uh, right off. Uh, anybody like to anybody like to start? Yes. Uh, yes. I think you need to be good and loud. Right? Okay. Um, do we? Yeah. Oh, we have mic. Mic. So. Yeah. Did you press speak? If it's green, it's working. Okay. Now. Yes. Yes. Okay. I have a question. Um, basically, you're saying that the government could issue as much money as it wants. Uh, my question is. I was under the understanding that if the government didn't have enough money, uh, it borrowed the difference. And as a result of the borrowing, it incurred uh, a debt which had an interest payment. And, and the reality is that the government has a huge uh, debt, and the uh, servicing of that interest is a very significant portion of the annual uh, budget. And I don't see where your explanation uh, it doesn't seem to uh, uh, agree with um, the power of the government to issue money. I assume you're almost saying debt free. Yeah. Um, let me, I, I don't want to quibble too much with this, but issue as, as much as it wants is a little bit different from what I was saying. Okay. It can't run out of its own currency, um, but. Uh, I gave the example of a, uh, things not being for sale in the domestic currency. So it takes two to tango, okay? If there are unemployed people who want jobs, the government can hire them, okay? If there's nobody who wants a job, the government can offer jobs and it's not going to be able to spin the money into existence, okay? So that, that's a, a minor little quote. Now, when the government spends, it credits a bank account and credits the reserves of that bank. That is a government debt. Okay? Currency is a government debt. Okay. So all of these credits the government is making, whether it's an electronic entry or issuing a tally stick to you, the government is in debt. All money things are debts of their issuers. Okay. The difference is that these are non-interest paying debts. 
So currency is government debt, but we don't normally include it in our figure of 15 trillion or whatever the, the outstanding uh, bonds are because they don't pay interest. Similarly, bank reserves are a government debt, a debt of the central bank. Okay. Again, in the old days, they didn't pay any interest. They're not included as part of the measured government debt, the figures that you, that you always read about. So again, this might seem like a little quibble, but I just want to make clear. All of those credits that the government is, is giving are debt, in the same way that bonds are debt. It's just that we don't promise to pay interest on them. So why does the government issue some bonds that banks use reserves to buy or that households can use their deposits to buy? The bonds promise to pay interest. Why does the government do that? What I was explaining is the government does that to hit its overnight interest rate target. It is not a borrowing operation. In fact, the government cannot sell those bonds unless you already have government debt to buy them. You have to have currency or you have to have bank reserves or your bank has to have bank reserves to buy them. Because the only thing the government will accept in payment for the bonds that it issues is its own debt, its own IOUs. So bond sales actually don't change the amount of government debt out there. They change the form from non-interest paying to interest paying. Now, does a sovereign government need to do this? No, they never need to do this. If they're happy with a zero interest rate, they can just leave the reserves in the banking system and you will have a zero overnight interest rate. So I realize people are very concerned about government paying interest on its debt. And as you said, it becomes a rising share of total government spending. But look at it this way. In the first place, the government doesn't have to sell any bonds. It can just leave reserves in the banking system, okay? On which the banks get zero in the old days. Now it's near zero interest. They get 25 basis points. Okay, so it doesn't have to sell them in the first place. Second place, the government can choose the interest rate that it pays. It's the sovereign issuer of the currency. It can sell the bonds to achieve the interest rate target that its central bank arm has set. Okay, 50 basis points now. The government chooses that interest rate. And the third point is, the government can always afford to make the interest payments. Why? Because the government makes interest payments in the same way that it does any kind of spending, by crediting a bank account. All right? And as the St. Louis Fed said, it can never run out of dollars. So if the government chose, oh, let's pay 10% on our government bonds, and let's run the debt up to $15 trillion, is there any conceivable way that the government won't be able to pay the interest on that? The answer is no. There is no conceivable way. They can always afford it. Because they make the interest payments by crediting bank accounts. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that we should have 10% interest rates. I'm not necessarily saying that we ought to sell government bonds at all. But it's a policy choice. Why does the government do it? Because your pension funds like to have government bonds in their portfolios, and they like to earn interest. Maybe it's a good public policy to sell bonds, stuff the private pension funds full of them, and pay them interest. But it's a policy choice. It's not forced by markets. It's not forced by any natural laws. We choose to do it. Okay. Sorry, I, now I remember I'm supposed to keep answers short. <laughs> so you want to come back? Very briefly, I can't say I really fully understood the details, but um, just as a follow-up, if it takes place as you say they do, is there a transfer of wealth taking place? Uh, is that what's going on in the country now, a transfer of wealth through this mechanism? Yeah, okay. This would be one of the considerations you want to make 
when you decide whether it's a good idea to pay interest on government debt. You want to look at who holds the government debt, okay? If it was elderly, social security recipients with insufficient private saving, you might say it's a good policy. On the other hand, if you find that financial wealth is extremely concentrated in the hands of the top 1%, you might say, this is not a good policy. We need to find an alternative way to make sure that our seniors have a decent income. Because paying interest on government bonds is flowing to the top. I think this is a, a good question for Michael. Okay. Uh, I'll have the back, yeah. Um, it, uh, as I understand it, Government is selling bonds to affect the Fed funds rate um, and control interest rates in the domestic economy. Then why does it have an interest in selling uh, bonds to foreign investors? Okay. It's selling bonds to hit its target rate. Okay. And I know, again, there, there's a lot of concern that foreigners hold a lot of the government bonds, especially right now it's Chinese, okay? And before that it was Japanese. How do they get them? They get dollar credits to bank accounts and to their central bank's account at the Fed when they sell us stuff and we buy it with dollars. So they have accounts that are full of dollars at the central bank, okay? So there are reserves there. And when we sell bonds, they have the option of using those reserves to buy bonds. So again, it's just a substitution from a non-interest bearing account at the Fed to an interest bearing account at the Fed. It's like going from your, your checking account to your savings account. They transfer the funds, and actually it is the Fed that transfers the funds. The Fed keeps the books for our government. Um, again, if we don't like paying interest to foreigners, have a zero interest rate target. Okay? I guess my question is, what's the government's interest in offering the interest bearing versus the non-interest bearing account? Does that make sense? Well, again, I, I don't, personally, I don't think that there is a, a very good reason for doing this. I think that it's sort of, a, well, we've always done it. The governments have always sold bonds, and they've always kept their overnight interest rate above zero. Personally, I think the system would operate better without any interest-paying debt and with an overnight interest rate target of zero permanently. I wouldn't use the interest rate in the way that most central banks use it to try to fine-tune the economy. I think it's been a disastrous failure, and it has led to lots of misunderstanding and payment of interest to foreigners. Okay, um, the uh, hard part of being a moderator is you have to keep quiet, and I have a lot of tough questions for this speaker. At least I think they're tough questions. But I, I, because time is rushing by, I think, and I'm sorry about this, but I think we have to give our second speaker a chance, and then after that, there will, will be time for questions which we can direct to both of the speakers. So if you don't mind, if you can save up your question uh, until after Michael Hudson has given his talk. Uh, and so, um, excuse me for this, but Michael, it's your turn. It's very strange to have a historian uh, and a, an economist on uh, the same program. I was joking with Professor Harris earlier that uh, if economics is correct, history could not have existed. It's logically impossible according to everything you're taught in the economics department here. Uh, on the other hand, if history actually existed, then everything you're taught in economics is a parallel universe science fiction. They're, they're incompatible. Uh, the economists say that uh, money and uh, interest and credit all begun by individuals bartering, uh, as if you were Alan Greenspan and uh, uh, Ayn Rand somehow on a desert island, uh, very selfishly deciding uh, how to uh, truck and barter trying to make a profit off each other. Uh, <laughs> maybe each win. But uh, if you look at history, this isn't what happened. Uh, Randy began uh, with a, something that he, a bone that he said was 50,000 years old. It wasn't. 
It was 28,000 years old. He couldn't read it. My friend Alex Marshak at a Harvard University at the Peabody Museum can read it. It was a calendar bone of uh, the uh, movements of the moon. The job of the chieftain in the Paleolithic societies that Alex described uh, was to keep the calendar because all social and economic life centered around the movements of the season, the calendar, bringing people together at the solstices or equinoxes uh, in uh, chief parts. And the reason I mention this is that money and credit and interest and enterprise all uh, can only be understandable once you understand the calendar, uh, which is not taught uh, in the economics courses, but I'll explain what I mean. Uh, in these primitive societies, from the Ice Age down to the Stone Age and into the Bronze Age, and even today in the tribal societies that anthropologists talk about, it's considered very impolite to try to make money. If there was somebody like Alan Greenspan or Ayn Rand, and if one of them were the chieftains, they would be thrown out of their chieftains. It's considered bad manners. In Australia, uh, they say uh, the uh, nail that stands up from the wood gets hammered down. Uh, and the reason is, in a low surplus society, if somebody makes a lot of money or a profit, they make it off somebody else. And society cannot afford to have wealthy people make money at other people's expense, pushing them below the break-even point so that they are unable to support themselves, unable to have their own land. Because if you do this, then what's going to happen? The people will emigrate and just leave the society. Uh, or as uh, we Irish say about uh, modern elections, we vote with our backsides. In that case, they do what they do. When uh, Alan Greenspan's and neoliberal policies are imposed in, on uh, Latvia, uh, the, the working force emigrates. When it's imposed on Greece, the working force emigrates. This has gone back uh, for tens of thousands of years. So what happened in uh, the development of Western civilization was there was one part of the world where it was necessary to have a surplus. Because while the ideal of every early society was to be self-sufficient, everybody had to grow their own foodstuffs, it's almost as primitive as if you lived in, say, modern-day Moscow, where you have to uh, have a country dacha to grow your food, uh, to bring in to uh, that. Uh, most people in uh, the ancient Near East uh, ha had uh, plots on the land to support themselves, whether they lived on the land uh, or in the cities. However, this uh, Mesopotamia, uh, in the Near East uh, had this rich soil that was de uh, deposited uh, by rivers for uh, millions of years, very rich, good for growing crops, but because it was all deposited uh, by rivers, it didn't have metal, it didn't have stone, and they didn't have even very much hardwood, so they had to trade. Now the question is, if you're going to settle in a country like modern, uh, which is where modern Iraq is, how are you going to get the metal? and uh, the uh, raw materials that you need to make the Bronze Age, the Bronze Age, uh, to make uh, the metal implements you needed uh, to do farming and other things. Uh, the solution was uh, to essentially set up public institutions, the temples and the palaces, uh, and basically these evolved out of the chieftain's households, but somehow the chieftains were, uh, it was a multi-ethnic society, uh, of uh, Semites, uh, Sumerians, nobody quite knows where they come from, uh, other groups, uh, and they uh, had to agree on a kind of uh, honest broker of standardization. And the first uh, standardization, the origins of almost all of the economic enterprise that we have today, money, coinage, debt, uh, in payment of interest, contracts, uh, legacies, uh, all of these agreements come from one part of the world, Sumer, basically in the third millennium BC from about uh, 3200 BC to about 1200 BC. So the palaces basically had, uh, were where the economic surplus uh, was organized and the palace, uh, uh, just as chieftains in an anthropology society would support the widows and orphans uh, and other dependents, the cripples in their households, uh, so the temples of Sumer did this. Uh, when I say widows and orphans, it's, it's always very confusing to an economic audience. Widows and orphans in antiquity did not have trust funds. Uh, today you, have, you say we, have, we have to keep the interest higher, the widows and orphans can't live. 
uh, the widows and orphans were actually not the richest people of society as they are today. They were actually the poorest people of society. So in the Bible, when they talk about widows and orphans, they're, uh, they're not talking about the billionaires who uh, the presidents are talking about when they say we need to uh, uh, keep wages low and interest rates high so the widows and orphans can uh, get their uh, standardized income. Well, anyway, uh, the temples uh, would, or would essentially employ them in the weaving workshops. They would consign the, uh, the textiles and the weaving things to uh, mer traveling merchants, and uh, the merchants uh, would take something worth, say, uh, five minutes, and in ten years, or five years, they would have to give back uh, twice as much, uh, double the sum. That was the origin of interest. It was supposed to approximate what uh, the merchants uh, would get. And as it happened, uh, the, the five years was a period of 60 months. And so the standard of uh, the dollar they used, the standard of value, uh, the minna, was divided into 60 shekels, just like minutes and seconds are, are 60th uh, come uh, from that period of the time. Uh, so you had a doubling time of debt of five years. Now, you also gradually had uh, the public institutions in charge of uh, unused land or free land that wasn't settled. This land was lent out to, to uh, cultivators or sharecroppers uh, for one-third of the crop. And based on this one-third of the crop, interest rates were also charged uh, at, at one-third. Uh, and basically, uh, land would be advanced, uh, perhaps cattle, if people needed money, uh, that would be advanced. And that we have even uh, a function called uh, the ale women. The, uh, they'd go to a bar and they'd uh, uh, run uh, up a tab uh, at the bar. Now the interesting thing is these debts uh, were owed in barley. And one of the first things that many rulers did in the ancient Near East, the first thing they would do would be to announce a set of prices. Uh, and in Hammurabi's laws, for instance, uh, one shekel of silver was the equivalent of one liter uh, of barley. So the, if you made barley, you could pay in barley. There was also uh, a, a rate of exchange with uh, sheep, with wool, uh, with other ways of paying debts. So the original uh, money was a price schedule uh, to enable people to pay uh, in kind. And the barley, obviously people did not go around with barley in the pocket because it really doesn't uh, last very well. Uh, people didn't use money actually to pay. Uh, what they would do during the crop year, they would do essentially what somebody would do at a bar today. They run up a tab. Uh, and they would run up a tab with the ale woman. Uh, for uh, money that would be due on the threshing floor at uh, the seasonal harvesting time. And in fact, almost all the barley debts, and we have the contracts from uh, uh, Mesopotamia, uh, were due on the threshing floor at barley time. Uh, the silver debts uh, were due at another time. Uh, and you, this was the, I, the principle that uh, lasted until about 1200 B.C. Then, uh, instead of global warming now, there was a global freezing then. There was a dark age. Uh, we sort of lose uh, statistics and uh, writing for uh, until about 750 BC. Then, what you had was a gradual recovery, and you had traders coming from Syria and Phoenicia uh, across the Mediterranean uh, to Greece and antiquity. Uh, that's when civilization began to go downhill. Uh, it's usually considered the start of Western civilization. But what people think is the start of Western civilization was the falling apart of Near Eastern origins of civilization, of this uh, economy that had been put together in a very well-organized economy. Uh, and all of a sudden, instead of the public institutions, uh, you had uh, local chieftains uh, occurring. And in Rome, uh, very soon, you had the aristocratic families overthrow the kings. Uh, and the functions that were in the public sector in uh, the Near East all of a sudden were taken over by uh, private families. Uh, let's call them the Mafia, because that's basically what uh, the Roman oligarchy was. And there was a complete uh, change in policy from the Near Eastern Bronze Age to classical antiquity. Uh, when a new ruler would come to the throne in uh, Mesopotamia, the first thing they would do on their first full year of the throne was to proclaim a clean slate. Uh, and that's because uh, a lot of the debts that were denominated in barley 
couldn't be paid. If, there, uh, if you look at Hammurabi's laws again from 1750 BC, uh, uh, if there was a flood, uh, the debts were annulled. If there was a drought, the debts were annulled. If there was military hostilities and they couldn't be paid, the debts were annulled. And there was a general understanding that the debts tended to grow faster than the means to pay. Now, we have the mathematical training texts that scribes were taught in Babylonia in 2000 BC. And you can imagine my surprise after teaching graduate economics for uh, many years here in New York at the New School, that I found that the mathematics used in 2000 BC were far superior to the mathematical models being used today. Not simply because they had to use, uh, the scribes had to learn quadratic, quadratic equations, but because they had two basic uh, contrasts. They had uh, uh, the doubling time of debt. Uh, one of the exercises was how long does it take uh, a minute to double in uh, value? The answer is five years. How long does it take to quadruple in value? Ten years. How long does it take for it to multiply 62 times? The answer is uh, 30 years. So you knew that here's this uh, exponential curve of debt very rapidly. What we, they also had were uh, curves for the growth of herds and, uh, and output, and that was uh, an S-curve, just like almost all economic statistics today show an S-curve. But what you have, and I'll uh, show you shortly, is uh, the, contract, the tendency of the debts to grow faster than to be paid. So uh, the rulers, when they came in, would cancel the debts uh, for a very good reason. Unfortunately, in Babylonia uh, and Sumer, they there was never a explanation book, here's how we do things. Uh, but one of the Roman historians uh, wrote uh, the explanation he was given by the Egyptians for why the pharaohs canceled the debts. They said, if we don't cancel the debts, then the debtors are going to fall into bondage to the creditors, as you can read in the Bible, and uh, then uh, nobody's going to fight in the army and will be defeated. And so in order to keep a land-tenured army, we have, to have, we have to return the land to the people who've lost them to the creditors. We have to uh, free them from bondage. Otherwise, uh, everybody's going to leave. There will be depopulation, and uh, we'll be defeated. Uh, in the third century BC, a Greek uh, general called, uh, who went under the name of Tacticus wrote a uh, manual for how to conquer a town and how to defend a town. If you want to conquer a town, you say, I'm going to cancel your debts, and you'll get the people on your side. Uh, if you want to defend a town, you say, I'm going to cancel the debts of everybody, you know, as soon as we win. That's what Zedekiah did in Rome, but the Romans were mafiosi, and he went back on his word. No, that's what uh, Coriolanus did in Rome. That's what Shakespeare's play was all about, went back on his word. Uh, same thing in, in uh, Judah. Uh, Zedekiah in the Bible promised uh, to cancel them. He didn't. Uh, that's what makes the first millennium BC very different from the, uh, uh, the Bronze Age. Well, what happened by the time of uh, 133 BC was uh, in Rome you had basically a, a Milton Friedman philosophy uh, of uh, free markets uh, by the oligarchy. And what they realized in Rome was exactly what uh, President Nixon and Henry Kissinger realized in Chile. You can't have a free market for creditors if you don't murder everyone who disagrees with you. If you don't kill everyone who wants to cancel the debts, if you don't kill everyone who knows history, if you don't kill the labor leaders, you can't have a free market oligarchy style. So they, uh, they murdered the Gracchi, they murdered uh, the supporters of the debt cancellation, and uh, essentially there was a hundred years social war in Rome, uh, and the result was that uh, by the time the empire got going, one quarter of the Roman population was in debt, bondage, uh, or outright slavery. So uh, I'm going to do a little fast forward to the modern era. At the time of the American Revolution, uh, the, uh, oh, by the, in the medieval time, after the Dark Age, you had something new that didn't occur in antiquity. You had public debts. No, and all these debts were for war debts. Basically, it began with the Templars, uh, in, after the Crusades, and then the Venetians and the Genoese, the big bankers lending to uh, kings in order to wage war. By the time of the Napoleonic Wars, 75% of Britain's budget, uh, the public budget, was spent on debt service. So at the time of the American Revolution, Adam Smith, Reverend Richard Price, and other people were in, who said, oh, sent congratulations to the American revolutionists. They said, let them go free. It's not worth waging war. 
I'm not sure how to go down with this, but here is a chart that was done uh, in 1776 by uh, Richard Price, who said, if, uh, one, if, Jesus, if one penny was saved at the rate of 5% at the time of Jesus, this penny would now be a solid sphere of gold extending from the sun out to the planet Saturn. I actually recalculated it, it would go all the way to the planet Uranus. Uh, and uh, he was trying to show the uh, impossibility of ever trying to pay uh, the national debt as it, uh, it amounted to. Now we know that there were many uh, uh, rich people uh, that did save pennies in the time of Jesus. Uh, in fact, Seneca, uh, the philosopher, made up over 20% on his loans to Asia Minor. Uh, uh, Cicero made uh, uh, a lot of loans. Uh, none of these uh, debts ever were repaid because again and again there was a collapse of, of when there was a bankruptcy. The uh, debtor would fall into bondage. Uh, the good thing about bankruptcy and about modern bankruptcy laws is not only is the debt canceled, but something even better happens. The savings are canceled. And today, you have 90% of the savings and net savings in America held by the upper 10% of the population. These are the population today that are trying to do to the American economy uh, what the, uh, the oligarchy uh, did in Rome, basically, which is to impose a kind of uh, debt peonage on the population where you have a situation that uh, if you buy a house, you have to take a 30-year uh, mortgage uh, and essentially spending the rest of your life uh, paying off uh, the mortgage debt to get a place of li to live, whereas land used to be free to all citizens originally. To get an education, you have to now take an, uh, an, a student loan out uh, that is going to absorb your income for 10 or 20 years, that is not subject to the bankruptcy laws, that cannot be wiped out, uh, that essentially, whether you get a job or not, uh, you have to pay. The result is that many students, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, are, uh, who are not able to get jobs have to live with their parents. The parents have to pay the loan. Uh, the Republican presidential candidate, Mitt Romney, said, we'll borrow the money from your parents and repay, you know, because they're not going to dun you, like uh, you're reading about in the Wall Street Journal, is happening with student loans. You're having the entire society now uh, loaded so down with debt that one quarter of American real estate uh, owns, owes a larger debt than the money is available for. So what you're having is uh, essentially money is debt deflation. That's why we're having the bad, the bad employment statistics that uh, on Monday, you remember, or the, the day after uh, the uh, President uh, Obama's speech, uh, out came the employment figures, and every uh, newspaper article of almost every economic uh, uh, statistic has two words, uh, unexpected and surprising. Well, yesterday, there are new figure. the Financial Times reported the new consumer credit in America. And it says uh, consumer credit in the U.S. unexpectedly fell in July. And then it, again, it said uh, nobody, who could have thought, uh, debt revealed surprised fall uh, in debt. Well, here's what happens. People have to pay off the debts or they get the Dunning phone calls that uh, many of you as students might get. If you pay the creditor, you are not able to, uh, to buy goods and services. Something has to give. And in America, you have about 40% of the American workers' budget uh, going to pay uh, for housing. 15% of the uh, wages uh, are taken out for Social Security and Medicare uh, as loans to uh, the government. Instead, whereas uh, Randy has said, the government doesn't really need this money. The government says, well, we want to keep uh, wages down. We want to keep spending power down. So we're uh, making you pre-save for Social Security. Uh, so that we have a huge fund that now that we have this money, we can afford to cut taxes on the rich uh, so that, and pretend that somehow the whole uh, thing is in balance uh, until you have uh, the Bowles Simpson Commission that says, well, we can't afford to pay. We only pay the rich, uh, not uh, the Social Security people. Uh, after all, that basically is the political dynamic we have here. Uh, so what you're having as a result of the government absorbing money uh, for debt service and the government bailing out the banks with uh, $13 trillion worth of bank giveaways 
is that uh, the debts have been left in place for the American economy at such a high rate that uh, the corporations must pay a high amount of money. If you're hiring a worker here, you have to pay the worker a high enough money to pay 40% of his income for housing, 15% for social security, 15% for other debt, uh, and about 10% uh, uh, in other taxes. So before the worker has enough money even to begin buying goods and services, 75 to 80% of his income goes to the finance, insurance, and real estate sector. Uh, and the economy, basically, uh, is uh, two economies. Well, uh, the result is that, uh, at least in America, things have been kept going because the Federal Reserve and the government, basically, has been able to keep monetizing enough money to, in, to keep the economy uh, from collapsing. That's not the case in Europe. Uh, every central bank w was uh, founded to do just exactly what Randy has said, to monetize the government debt mainly the war debt, but basically to uh, create, uh, uh, create money and say, uh, here's money, we're spending it into the economy. This growth in debt in every country is what has provided the private sector with uh, enough money to uh, keep growing and transacting goods and services. Uh, in the, for the first time uh, in modern history, under the Clinton administration, he actually run a budget sur uh, surplus. That meant the government is the government was not spending money into the economy, uh, that uh, people if, in, had to borrow from the banks at interest. So uh, when the government uh, balanced the budget, this was a bonanza for the banks, because now they uh, would lend to people, and uh, Ellen Greenspan said, borrow against your house, you can always sell it to the greater fool three years down the road, so take out a three-year mortgage, it doesn't have an exploding interest rate that goes up because the average American moves every three years, and you can always find somebody else because I, Alan Greenspan, am going to keep flooding the economy with enough money to make you all rich by going into debt. Well, this is the first time in history when people thought that they could get rich by going into debt. Every society until now has tried to stay out of debt, to avoid mortgaging the house, to avoid taking the risk, uh, but now uh, they're going into debt. Uh, we can see the disaster that would happen in America by looking at Europe, where uh, the European Union does, uh, does not have a central bank and, uh, that is monetizing the government debt. Uh, the bank laws uh, were, ri were written by the banks to, uh, to force the banks to provide all of the money that the private sector needs to grow. And sure enough, the, uh, the debt has absorbed uh, everything so that uh, in this uh, uh, week's New York Review of Book, George Soros has an analysis along very similar lines saying exactly why uh, the European Union uh, is falling apart uh, for that. So uh, the phenomenon that we're facing today is debt deflation, uh, people having to pay the debt, and it's needless. Uh, in antiquity, uh, any, uh, the rulers would have simply wiped out the debt, and people think that that's unthinkable. Uh, it, it, on this very floor in this very building on Sunday, uh, Sheila Baer uh, gave a talk to the alternate banking group of Occupy Wall Street uh, and was saying how she wanted to close down Citibank. She said there's no reason at all that we could, have, could not have paid all of the insured depositors at Citibank. What would have been wiped out are the derivatives and all the gambling uh, that don't have anything to do with uh, real lending for goods and services. Uh, the banks lend essentially not to produce, uh, but to, uh, uh, against collateral, to bid up real estate prices and stock prices. Government spending that Randy's talking about is spent on goods and services, guns and bombs and the things governments spend money on, but also employment and roads and bridges. Uh, and so you have a completely different kind of money uh, as opposed to bank credit spent on different things, goods and services, as opposed to asset prices. So uh, I wanted to give this background to conceptualize that there are two spheres of the economy. The asset sphere of real estate uh, and uh, financial securities as opposed to the goods and services. Economics department talks as if money is only spent on goods and services, but 99% of bank credit is spent on mortgages, bank loans, stocks, and bonds, and that is all invisible uh, in the economics curriculum. Uh, that's why we're here today in a series of talks to fill in uh, what you don't get in the economics department. Thank you. Well, I think we should concentrate.
concentrate on uh, we should concentrate on Michael Hudson for a few minutes, and then we might open things up for a uh, wider discussion. Uh, I don't think that the um, eurozone is in quite as much uh, crisis as uh, our speakers have suggested. Uh, the Greeks may get thrown out, and there are problems in Spain. Uh, the eurozone uh, is doing rather well for some of its components. Uh, one of the great advantages of the uh, situation that has existed the last uh, few years in the Euro eurozone, um, uh, you can see in the largest economy in, uh, in Europe, mainly in Germany, and, and um, the Germans uh, benefit enormously at, at the moment uh, and will continue to do so from the fact that the euro is cheaper against the dollar uh, than, it, uh, than, uh, the, than it will be um, if uh, the weaker economies were uh, thrown out of the euro. Uh, it's a dollar twenty-five now. If the weaker uh, uh, if the weaker economies were thrown out, it would be a dollar seventy-five, and it would be correspondingly difficult for the Germans to sell things. The Germans are selling things very well uh, at the moment, and they, they benefit from this situation. And every, every businessman in Germany, I mean, I've spoken to some of these people, they know this uh, very well. This is one of the reasons why they tolerate the present situation in which the Germans are paying the debts of, of other countries. In fact, uh, from the point of view of German business and from the point of view of German employment as well, Germans have other problems in their economy. It's not growing very fast by, uh, by their standards or indeed by any, any reasonable standards. But, uh, uh, but they have better employment figures than most people, which is the thing which really counts in my opinion anyway. Uh, so that, that's a more complicated story than is emerged from these talks. But now this is a question period and I'm only a moderator. If I start ranting on, I could rant on about a lot of stuff, including Michael Roman history. But, we, but let's uh, uh, open up this to the floor. Yes. Is there a difference? Is there any difference in any of your opinions? Uh, could you use the mic, please? We have a little louder. Is there any difference in you your press the green. I, I have pressed it. <laughs> I'll shout. It's okay. Now. Shout. Okay. Yes. Is there any difference between money, that is currency, and wealth? People think of real wealth as being something tangible, houses and means of production. Um, when uh, in the 19th century, when people talk about capital, it was the tangible means of production. Capital was the factories and buildings and machinery to employ labor to produce goods and services to sell at a profit. Uh, but finance, uh, financial wealth is the opposite. That's, uh, this wealth that we're talking about is on the asset balance sheet. But financial wealth, stocks and bonds and money, are on the liability side of the balance sheet. Uh, against the factory, you'll have a stock or a bond. This is a claim on wealth. It's not wealth itself. So Frederick Soddy, uh, a physicist, uh, called it virtual wealth in the 1920s. It's a, uh, the wealth that uh, Alan Greenspan means is the antithesis of what m most people mean by wealth. It's a claim on wealth, and to Alan Greenspan, the financial wealth should be able to devour uh, all physical wealth to the point where there is no more housing, no more factories, uh, all the machinery is closed, and you have the dark age that happened when the Romans uh, followed this very same uh, early Milton Friedman, Alan Greenspan uh, dark age. Yes. I guess as an equity portfolio manager, I have to disagree with you that equity is not like debt. I think it's different than what you're saying, but I think it is the that is wealth is basically the fact of what you can produce, and I think equity is a share of that. It's different than debt. But it, it's, it's true that equity does not uh, uh, have to pay interest, and it's paid out of profits. But it, uh, net worth is on the liabilities side of the balance sheet. So it does it, and, and if you're looking at it mathematically, it's on right, uh, there, the liability side. There always has to be a liability. It's a claim. Asset. The question is whether it's artificial debt explanation, whether it's actually. Right. But besides that, I like your point. Uh, two questions for you. One, I think uh, the professor's point was interesting about Europe, but the question, I guess, would be how long do you think, and I think the Italians would probably be the first ones to not want to be debt slaves so that Germany can produce their sort of exporting economy. Do you think that it's going to be more sort of the Italians or maybe the, the Spanish who decide uh, this is not really a good idea for them, or how do you think the Euro sort of uh, I, I wish you would have pressed the green button on that so it could be recorded, but uh, the, the basic principle at work in Europe is the same principle that is universal. Debts that can't be paid won't be. There is no way that anybody has made a mathematical model 
where uh, Italy or Greece or, uh, or Spain or Portugal can pay the debts that they owe. So the, the real question is how won't they be paid? Will they not be paid by imposing austerity and trying to squeeze more and more out of the economy until 80% of Europe moves to Iceland? Or are they going to just finally let the debts go by the board and say, okay, uh, we're not going to pay them finally, we're not going to make the 99% uh, spend their life in debt p and to the 1%. Something has to give, because that's the mathematics of compound interest uh, that grow uh, so much more rapidly than the S-curve of the real economy. Uh, when there's debt deflation, there's a constant flow of uh, uh, debt service and penalties uh, up to uh, the creditor top. So Europe is, uh, is, the reason I held up George Soros' article was he says that Europe is polarizing between Germany and France on the creditor side and uh, Southern Europe, uh, the periphery, very much like uh, Latin America in the 1980s under the IMF austerity programs. Uh, the principle, the bankers believe that austerity is the way to get rich. They mean it's the way for them to get rich by making the rest of you poor. That's their philosophy. That's what's taught in economics textbooks. You learn how a race to the bottom is what you want to do if you're at the top. Uh, and this is a crazy way of doing things, but it's the way that the European uh, uh, common market is organized. Uh, the, uh, there are more and more of the uh, German exporters that say, wait a minute, how are we going to export to Greece and Portugal and Italy if, they can't, if uh, there's <coughs> austerity uh, and they're taxed more to pay the creditors and then they can't afford to buy our, our uh, exports anymore? Uh, yeah, that's big is market, the argument that's going on. You want to come back? No, I think yeah, I think I think that is how it's likely to, to be green. Yeah. I guess the other question I would ask you is, you know, one of the things I think this is a very very important issue for the political spectrum. Can you press the green button so it's recorded? Uh, you know, in this this time period, you mentioned obviously the debt ceiling, which was the self-imposed potential disaster that we narrowly avoided. But you also hear things like I think our you know, our relationship with China is driven by this fear that somehow, you know, they hold our debt, so if we don't play ball, we're you know, suddenly in trouble. Whereas, you watch what Bernanke's done, it's very clear, trillion dollars done, and we can take care of it tomorrow, yet there's no politician speaking this way. And so, I guess my question to you is, why is the points you guys are bringing up so devoid from both parties, really, of having any sort of understanding of this? And we're making really, really bad policy decisions, regardless of whether you're on the left side or the right side of the aisle. We're making extraordinarily bad policy on some sort of imaginary... Uh... This is a wonderful point. This is a discussion I often have with Chinese officials uh, when I meet with them over there. Uh, the, um, the United States, since the Vietnam War, has been pushing do all these dollars go into the foreign economy by America's military spending. I wrote this in Super Imperialism uh, in 1972. The book's translated in Chinese uh, by, the, uh, by the government uh, in, into Japanese. Uh, the American government throws off the, uh, the military spending dollars. The dollars end up being spent on, uh, accu accumulating in China. China then has a problem. What do we do with these dollars? Uh, the, uh, if we don't send them back to the United States, then our currency is going to go way up against the dollar. So in order to stabilize the currency, they have to recycle it to the United States. But the Americans say, you're Chinese. We're not going to sell you our industry. We'll, we only sell our industry to white people, to be quite blunt about it. We, we won't sell you Sinuk. We'll sell white people Sinuk. Uh, the, uh, the, the uh, oil refineries, and uh, there's a racism there. And so Paulson, went, uh, and they said, look, we can't, uh, if we send the money back to America and invest in uh, treasury bills, then we're financing your military buildup for you to surround us with your atomic submarines to say you're going to bomb us if uh, we don't recycle our money to you, just like you told the Near East. Uh, you know, the end of this is going to be atomic war. Do you really want to go that way? So Paulson went over there and said, okay, we got a deal for you. We'll give you more money than the Treasury bills by Fannie Mae Securities. Uh, and this is one of the major reasons why, and so the Chinese Central Bank recycled the dollars that the American military deficit was throwing off into Fannie Mae Securities. This is one of the reasons why the government bailed out Fannie Mae, because one of the major holders were China and foreign governments, because there's not enough government debt to absorb all of the American military spending that's going abroad. Uh, finally, the Chinese got together with uh, the Russians, Brazil, 
India and now uh, South uh, Africa to say we, we want the way to stop America's military buildup is to uh, stop accepting dollars, we're going to have an alternative currency. We don't want to lend to America because what the money that we've lent to the United States, it's a hostage. It can do to us what it did to Iran. Uh, when Iran had money in Chase Manhattan Bank uh, right after the Shah died, it can simply grab it all and not pay it all. So they're trying, uh, the last thing the Chinese want is to leave these dollars hostage with the American government to finance uh, the military buildup here. This is how they talk in China. This is what the Central Committee reports uh, uh, are all about. Not a word of it in America. The pretense is that the trade deficit is all about private enterprise, goods and services, and buying Chinese goods. It's not. It's American military spending and the attempt to intimidate uh, Asia militarily. That's what's throwing off the government, and that's what money is today. The government debt that Randy's talked about, that I've talked about, is mainly the embodied military spending abroad. Let's open this up to uh, involve both of the speakers. And uh, I'm sorry to have made you wait before. It's your turn. <clears throat> Are you able to hear me? It says speak. Is it on? Yeah. 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 Um, basically, I agree with your um, approach to money and debt by having governments, the public sector, uh, spend into circulation money or credit. And so this whole money and credit system versus a debt system, I think is really a uh, challenge for not only the US government, but all governments to, to pursue. However, I think we have to take one step further besides this kind of money uh, or credit-based system. And what we really have to look into and research, I suppose, is the whole integrated global gov governance system of which, of course, the monetary system is a very important one because, to a great extent, the monetary system is like a glue that keeps the monetary, the financial, the economic and the commercial systems together. And so what I've been working on is on the idea given also that we live in severe carbon-constrained times on account of climate change and climate crisis, is to have a new monetary system based upon a carbon standard. And so what that would do is you would have, you, you would have a uh, global central bank that would be able to spend into uh, circulation the monies that particular governments want to, uh, to spend on, and basically on productive assets. So, um, so though I feel that the monetary system, the financial system based upon credit and money is very valuable, as it was also indicated that in 1865 when the Lincoln Senate document and also nowadays the Kucinich uh, legislation are also, which are also supporting this. I, I do think that we really have to start pushing for a far larger framework where nations start cooperating monetarily and if they want them to think in terms also of the climate crisis, besides only the economic ones, I think that seems to me an important way to go, and I'm eager to hear what the two speakers have to say about this. Okay. Um, the kind of system that I described with sovereign currencies might not be the ideal system. But I think it's the best system that we've got, given that international cooperation in the way that you're talking about is extremely difficult to do. If we look at what has happened in Europe, by going to a single central bank for 
nominally independent countries, which were working toward integration in a wide variety of ways. Okay. Uh, uniform standards, freedom of movement, freedom of capital flows and all that, and look at how it's turned out, and I strongly disagree with the view that because Germany is doing so well, therefore Eurozone is a su success, I think it shows precisely the opposite. We had a system designed to benefit an exporter country. Germany has 75 to 80 percent of all the net exports within Euroland. And yes, of course, it's doing well in a system designed to benefit a net exporter. Everyone else suffers because of this. And I just fear that although your system, and, and there are a number of people working on the, these carbon-based uh, monetary systems, possibly it, it is a better system, but in the political realities that we have, I just cannot see that we will be benefited by moving to an even bigger ECB that is going to be the world's, the global central banker. Uh, many people refer to, so I know I, I need to keep this short, uh, Keynes had sort of a similar Bancor plan and he said it might require a global central bank and I don't know that this is politically feasible. I also am not sure it's politically desirable. I don't see any central bank around the world that comes close to what I would like to be in control of monetary policy. I certainly wouldn't want the Fed controlling everybody's monetary policy because it's done such an extraordinarily bad job in the United States. Someone else? Yes. I think the, Ch uh, the Chinese also seem to me to be irrational and not part of the, the problem in the sense that their dollar accumulation was overwhelmingly, it seems to me, based upon our trade deficit. The consequence of, well, no. uh, which they chose instead of raising the standard of living of their own population, it seems to be the triumph of their private sector that expanded exports and kept wages down in order to do so. So it seems to me that was an irrational choice on the Chinese part to accumulate these surpluses in a country that really could use them for uh, increasing the standard of living. Uh, they had national security uh, concerns for this. They needed to build up enough money so America could never destroy them like it had destroyed uh, Russia and uh, Korea and the other countries in the Asia crisis of uh, uh, 1997. Uh, 1906. Uh, they wanted, they needed to protect themselves. Now that uh, Europe uh, and the United States economy is uh, shrinking with debt deflation, now they are going to turn to the domestic mar uh, market and indeed begin to raise uh, wages very sharply. So the output of China that used to go to the West is now indeed going to go to their own uh, customers. Uh, they, uh, their uh, dollar reserves will be spent mainly in trying to buy foreign raw materials that are needed to go into the goods and services uh, that they produce. Uh, but they are indeed going to now turn to the uh, internal market. They had very good national security reasons for uh, accumulating dollars first. They needed to obtain the Western productive technology, and the only way to do this was to make a political deal letting enough American vested interests get rich off China that they were supporting uh, the government in uh, permitting this technology to be transferred to China rather than treating it like it treated the Soviet Union. I want to say some more? No. Okay. Um, up near to the back, yeah. Um, I'd like to ask the question um, to Mr. Ray. Uh, you mentioned uh, what, what your, your concept of money um, made a lot of sense to me in the context uh, of the United States. Japan and countries able to issue their own currency, debt in their own currency. Um, I'm wondering how you would explain the concept of a currency crisis and relating to that, you said money value or the value of money is based on the issuing authority. Um, could you tie this together for me, how a country such as Argentina or other countries are taking on debt in US dollars um, going 
coming to a currency crisis when investors mistrust uh, these, these countries and yeah, could you tie these, these two concepts together for me please, thank you. Okay, because of time constraints, uh, I only talk about countries that issue their own currency and float the currency, okay? The currency crises occur when you uh, peg your currency to another currency. So a dollar board is an extreme one, or just abandoning your currency and adopting the dollar, dollarization is even more extreme. These are the kinds of countries that get into currency crises because they, they can't meet the promise. Okay, So you find out that, that South Korea has been cooking the books a bit, doesn't have as many dollars as they've been reporting, what do you do? You get dollars, and immediately they've got to run uh, uh, out of their currency because everyone knows they can't make the promise. So fixed exchange rates reduce your policy space. The only way that you can make a, a credible promise is to operate your country in a manner that you've always got the dollars flowing in. That means you have to abandon full employment and other domestic policies that you might prefer to have in order to make sure that you can always hit that exchange rate. So we, we do discuss these things, but for time constraints, I focused it on, on the United States, but easily we can do countries that uh, have sovereign currencies but peg them. So they get into these kinds of problems. Why do countries issue dollar-denominated debt? Even some countries that don't peg their exchange rates decide to do this. Usually the reason is because they think, well, we can get a lower interest rate. Because they look at the dollar interest rate, say the U.S. government interest rate, and they say, oh, we can get a lower interest rate in dollars. The problem with that is that you've got a solvency problem. So in reality, they don't get lower interest rates. Okay? And the second problem with that is a currency, a, a, a country that has its own sovereign currency and floats can have any interest rate it wants anyway. It can have zero if it wants. It doesn't need to go to dollars, but they don't understand that. A less charitable uh, interpretation is that, the, that they're, they're dealing with Michael's 1% class that would prefer to have dollar-denominated debt. And so it's a political decision to do that. Yes? We, we have a couple of questions from the net. Uh, the first one, just related to this, was does a sovereign country need global cooperation to pull out of recession? So it can need global cooperation to pull out of recession. Uh, okay. uh, the second one is how does getting interest on reserves make it unnecessary to sell bonds? Can you please explain that? Uh, the third one is what if banks don't want to buy them? So what if there's a, an auction and nobody turns up? Uh, and the last one is, when Nixon called, closed the gold window, who were the winners and losers? And would the U.S. be spending constrained if the gold window was still open? Wait, go ahead. Go ahead and do it first. What? Can I remember it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you need global cooperation to, to get out of recession? If you have a sovereign currency, we already said, anything for sale in your currency is affordable. So if you have high unemployment, you're a, a, a sovereign nation, but not the United States, let's say. Let's say that you are a, a smaller country, maybe a poor country. Can you get out of recession? You can certainly employ the unemployed. Okay. If they're unemployed, by definition, they're willing to work for your currency. So you can certainly solve the unemployment problem. You may still have poverty. You may still have hunger but you can solve the unemployment problem. So I don't think you need global cooperation, but uh, you, you, if you're a, a poor nation, you may need uh, global cooperation to solve problems like poverty and hunger. Um, what if, what if uh, a sovereign government like the United States offered bonds and no banks wanted to buy them? Is it a problem? No, it's not a problem at all. What it means is the banks are happy to hold excess reserves and earn 25 basis points. If they're happy earning 25 basis points, why would you try to pay them 100 basis points? So it is not a problem if uh, no one wants to buy them. Does, does that mean that the government then would not be able to continue sort of deficit spending at that point under current legal constraints or is there a way around that? No. Under the current self-imposed constraints, we have special banks that must buy them 
when the Treasury needs to transfer uh, money from its private bank account to its deposit account at the Fed. So actually, I was doing the hypothetical that no bank wants to buy them, but in reality, there are banks that must buy them. I'll talk about that. When the U.S. went off gold, uh, it went off gold because of the Vietnam War. The entire uh, U.S. balance of payments deficit in the 1960s to 1972 was military spending. The statistics are all in the book. I mentioned super imperialism. Uh, when the U.S. went off gold, many people thought, oh, now we're in trouble. Uh, we don't have any gold to sell. What are we going to do? That's when I, I wrote the book, uh, and Herman Kahn of the Hudson Institute said, you've shown, uh, and what I said was, now uh, that people can't, uh, central banks cannot buy gold, there's only one thing they can buy, the U.S. dollars. They will have to lend money to the U.S., and instead of the gold standard, we have a U.S. Treasury bill standard, so other countries have to hold their central reserves in paying the United States enough money to military surround them and threaten to kill them all if they don't keep doing that. Herman Kahn uh, got up at a meeting of uh, Drexel Burnham and said, you've shown how we've pulled the biggest uh, rip-off in history. We've run rings around British imperialism. I will cripple your salary if you'll uh, stop teaching economics and come to work for me at the Hudson Institute. So I quit uh, teaching at the New School, went to the Hudson Institute, where the Defense Department immediately gave us an $85,000 grant to explain the principles of, so, of superim of imperialism and how we were forcing other people to finance our budget deficit. And, the, and uh, it became very conscious. They said, my God, who would have thought that going off gold actually doesn't give anybody an alternative? As long as we're, and uh, so then Herman Kahn and I went down to the uh, Washington, met with the Treasury Secretary, and he said, you know, I just got back from Saudi Arabia. We told them, if you, uh, you can charge whatever you want for your oil, but uh, if you don't uh, send all of this money that you get for the oil back to the U.S., we'll kill you, and we'll invade your country, and we'll kill all of your people. He, I, I'm summarizing. Uh, uh, paraphrasing. Not to say exaggerate. <laughs> so uh, that essentially is how the dollar standard came into being. It was a victory for the United States, and that's why uh, the BRIC countries, Russia, China, Brazil, and the others, are all trying to get out of it. Who else? There was one last one, which is, how does paying interest on reserves make it unnecessary to sell bonds, which is, I gather, a recent phenomenon in central banking practices. Okay, so yes, uh, so under Bernanke, uh, in, the, in the heat of the crisis, um, was able to, to uh, push forward, moving to a system in which the Fed started paying interest on reserves for the first time. The Fed and banks had wanted uh, Congress to allow them to do that, and they, we got to hurry up, and, and they did. What it means is that no matter how many excess reserves are in the banking system, you can't drive the overnight interest rate all the way to zero. You can only drive it to the interest rate that the Fed pays on reserves. Okay, uh, because no bank will lend to another bank at a rate lower than what they get, what they earn on their reserves held at the Fed. So it just means the the. <coughs> Uh, lowest you can go is not zero anymore, okay? Unless the Fed lowers what it pays to zero. Fairly soon we're going to wind up, but are there any uh, final questions? Uh, maybe it's the privilege of the uh, of the moderator to get the last word. I don't know. Uh, uh, well, uh, the question which uh, the question which arises a lot of the time is: Can we learn? from the past, I guess. And, um, uh, and uh, as a professional historian, I'm uh, rather pessimistic about that, I must say. First of all, you, you, we need good history. Uh, and I've heard a certain amount of fantasy history today, I must say. Um, we need very good history. By the way, I have to tell you, I, I hope this doesn't sound like professional prejudice. You know, people think that economics is difficult, biology is difficult, so on and so on. But history is easy because you can understand what historians are saying, after all, and you can argue back. History is difficult too, let me tell you, uh, uh, and, and it's getting more difficult because it's getting more, it's getting more technical all the time. Now you have to know uh, economics if you're going to write uh, economic history, which was not true, really true at one time. Um, so can we, can we learn from the past? Well, uh, yes, in some ways. It's, it's very 
it's uh, difficult to link things together uh, sometimes. So when I was uh, preparing for this, I think, well, okay, what can we learn about um, modern situations uh, from Roman economic history? Not very much, really, as a matter of fact, because after all, it's a, that was an agrarian economy, a slave-based economy most of the time in most places, uh, and it's radically different. If you drive a, um, uh, Michael made a very interesting point about this, if you, if you drive a farmer uh, off the land by burdening him with too much debt, uh, he ceases to be uh, a producer. He, he, he uh, is no longer a contributor to the economy. If you burden a modern person with debt, let's say mortgage debt, the story is rather, rather different. You're not taking away his livelihood uh, by uh, burdening him uh, with debt. Uh, it's a different kind of story, but there are similarities. You know, when people ask me what happened to the Roman Empire in the end, first of all, I say, well, there are about, um, according to one German study on this subject, there are about 650 explanations that have been offered for the fall of the Roman Empire, okay, uh, in round numbers. Uh, you could probably, probably that's out of date, there are probably more now, uh, because uh, and I'm not sure that uh, the author of that book included climate change, which we would include now probably as a possible explanation. So what caused the uh, uh, fall of the Roman Empire? Very complicated phenomenon, by the way, because it takes place in two completely separate uh, uh, sequences, one in the Western Roman Empire and the other one in the Eastern Roman Empire a couple of hundred years later. So it's a very complicated uh, phenomenon. Uh, so when I say why it happened, you'll realize that I'm uh, abbreviating things a bit. One thing that went wrong, though, and maybe it wasn't the most important thing, but one thing that went wrong was that uh, the emperors, in, first of all, in the Western Roman Empire, later in the Eastern Roman Empire, didn't collect enough tax revenue. Now, why they didn't collect enough tax revenue is complicated. Uh, partly because the tax base had shrunk. Uh, partly because they didn't have enough political power to force the rich to pay taxes. Uh, those were the two main things. But there were other factors as well, complicated uh, story. That's all to say um, that uh, one thing I'm sorry we didn't talk about today is what I see as one of the uh, great um, political psychological problems of the United States, and that is tax phobia. Uh, we were talking earlier about student debt. Why is there student debt? Because uh, we make students pay for their education in a sensible economic world, I think, uh, and I'm speaking as somebody who has uh, taught at Columbia University virtually throughout his uh, career, uh, undergraduate education would be free, or nearly, uh, and uh, it would be, it's absurd to make undergraduates uh, pay for education. Graduate education, well, that's a more complicated uh, story. Uh, you all pay lots and lots of money for your undergraduate education. Well, maybe not all of you, because some, some of you may be foreigners by origin, like me. Uh, I had an absolutely superb undergraduate education. It cost me nothing. Uh, well, except I had some rather luxurious habits, but my parents paid for those. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, my actual education cost nothing. It was paid for uh, by, uh, by the state, in effect. And it was a good investment. Well, except for the fact that after they'd invested in me, I, I emigrated. But basically, <laughs> it, was, it was a good idea for them to invest. Uh, in people like me. The taxpayers pay, uh, and they ought to pay now. But we have uh, a tax phobia which prevents us making this very sensible uh, investment in the education of the youth. Uh, if, we, uh, if there's one idea that we need to get rid of in our society, in my opinion, it's that uh, taxation is in itself an evil and that we ought to uh, resist it even when uh, when, let's say, discretionary spending of this kind uh, is, uh, is an issue. Well, uh, okay, I've probably used, about, used up about as much time as, as I'm entitled to as a moderator, and I want to go on to thank our speakers for uh, providing us with an extremely stimulating evening, uh, and uh, thank the organizers again, and thank those who ask questions, and uh, give the last word to uh, well, thank you very much for everyone who managed to stay till the end. Uh, I think that's actually a really good segue into the next event in the series, which will look at the relationship between taxation and the issuing of new currency and, and sort of whether or not there needs to always be a, 
one-to-one -one correlation there or whether or not there are sort of other uh, spaces there to use Randy's phrase. Um, and if you have any other further questions, as I said before, there will be the website available uh, in perpetuity and we will have uh, opportunities to uh, take further questions for the next event uh, where we will be continuing on this line of ideas. So please uh, keep coming, please keep telling other people about it and uh, please keep thinking about these ideas and coming up with some new questions. So thank you very much for attending. Thanks.